Hey guys, so don't mind my voice in this video. I know it sounds kind of funny. I'm actually at the end of about two weeks of being sick. And believe it or not, my voice sounds pretty normal compared to what it has been sounding like for the past couple of weeks. What I want to talk about today is moving abroad once again. Um, this is a topic that has come up multiple times on my channel. It's one of the main things I talk about because I am an expat. I'm an American. I live in France. I have lived in France for over two years now. Before that, I lived in the UK. I did a couple months in Spain. So I have lived in a few different countries and I love living abroad but it definitely has changed the way I approach some things, for better or for worse. Overall, there are pros and cons, of course, to every experience you can choose to do. Moving abroad is something that I have talked about so many times, I think it's so worth it, even if it's really temporary, if it's just six months or a year, or if you become one of those people who moves abroad and just never moves back. I mean, every person's gonna be different, everyone's life path's gonna be different. I'm not saying I'm gonna live abroad all of my life, but it's a great experience and it changes you in so many ways. That being said, it's impossible to talk about everything in one single video, so I have compiled five things that I've stopped doing since moving abroad that I used to do before and that I kind of doubt I'm gonna continue to do to the same extent, even if I would settle down someplace abroad or otherwise. The first thing that I stopped doing almost immediately when I first moved abroad, which would have been about five years ago when I moved to the UK, is buying trinkets and shelf accessories and little things like that. You'll notice that I do have some things. I've got a couple things back here. Um, I've got some stuff on my bookshelf in the other room, but I will say that the majority of those things are things that I had before that I brought over or things that were given to me. Like for example, this, what do you call this? Like the, the word board. That's what it's called now, a word board. That was a gift. And most other things I have here have a purpose. Like the books that I have, notebooks, candles, which you burn through. I very, very rarely buy stuff that just sits on a shelf. Since I've lived here in France now for a couple of years, I do have a few things. And obviously, like I said, I get gifts from people and I love those sorts of things. I love little trinkets to add a bit of decor, to add a bit of, of style, of personality to a place. But I very rarely buy stuff like that unless I really, really love it and it really will mean something to me because I, I really think practically. I think. What if I move in a year? I'm gonna have to drag all of that stuff with me. I'm gonna have to pack it in boxes. I'm gonna have to ship it if I move overseas. I've never been one of those people who just buys random things, who spends a lot of money. I tend to be a little bit frugal and I always have been, but I've always loved little things like that, like the little pop figurines, the little bobbleheads, and I have a few little Starbucks mugs, like the mini espresso shop mugs. But now I think so logically, and I have moved so many times, even within Paris, I've moved now, this is my third apartment in Paris. And before that, I have lived in different cities. I've just moved a lot and it's just made me think more about those types of purchases. The second thing that I have stopped doing, again, has to do with purchases. And that is I have stopped buying so many clothes. Again, I have never been the type of person to have a huge closet. I am just not really a spend I've never been a big spender, but I used to have a lot more clothes than I do now. When you live in one place, when you don't have to think about, again, packing them into a suitcase and paying for the weight and all of that, when you don't have to think about it, it's really amazing how fast your closets just pile up. For better and for worse. I mean, sometimes having that big closet is a burden and sometimes you hang on to stuff that you don't like anymore, you don't fit anymore, or that's in really bad condition and you just, you don't wear it or can't wear it, yet you still have it because you don't think about getting rid of it. That's the con. But on the other hand, sometimes having a nice big closet is nice because that means you have clothes for every occasion which I don't always have now. But again, I think it has to do with having made that move abroad. When I moved to the UK, it was supposed to be for one year, and it was one year. And I remember I only brought the things I thought I would really need, but then by about Christmas, I realized I didn't bring enough winter stuff. So some of my family visited me. I asked them to bring me a bunch of my winter stuff. And then I needed to move out in September, and I needed to take a flight with only one checked bag, and I couldn't fit my stuff into a checked bag. I mean, yes, to be fair, it's really impossible to fit a full wardrobe into one bag if you have all of your other things with you, like all of your shoes and all of your books and all of your like life things that you have to bring with you. That's a pretty impossible task to begin with, but it definitely just makes you think a little bit more about what you're buying and about what you actually need to wear. Another thing that I have stopped doing since moving abroad is using quite so much regional slang. This is something that I never noticed before. When you live in one specific place, Place, one specific region where there are certain words and certain phrases that just everybody says, you don't even notice that you're using them, honestly. And it wasn't until I moved to the UK, and not just because it was British English around me, but I think because a lot of my friends were Erasmus students, so they came from all over Europe. Plus then in the dorm where I lived, there were a ton of people from the world, so not just Europe. I was just around so many people who were not native speakers 
and that plus, you know, combined with the fact that British English was the standard around me, I think I realized just how much of what I was saying and just how much of how I expressed myself was a regional thing. And it's not that I hadn't traveled. I had traveled to many places in the US before. I traveled to Spain, I traveled to Canada, I traveled to Mexico, to Puerto Rico. I had traveled plenty before I moved abroad. But it's different when it's your everyday life and when you really immerse yourself 100% in a different accent, in a different uh, native language around you, even if you're all speaking English, when, when people have different native languages, they bring different characters and sometimes translated expressions. And it really makes you very much aware of how you're speaking, what you're saying, how you're expressing yourself. That's not to say, of course, that I like started speaking British English. You can hear, obviously, I'm very much American. I have not completely lost my American vocabulary. There are some things that I sort of sponged from British vocabulary, like I say flat once in a while, and I obviously take away sometimes instead of to go. Some things did stick and sometimes my brain just kind of flips back and forth because I can't decide which one is more normal. But at the end of the day, I was born in the Midwest. I grew up in the Midwest. That is my accent. That is my region. And that's the slang that is most normal to me. But I don't use nearly as much of it. Not nearly as much of it. And I think I've even changed the way I speak to some extent. I think I speak more neutrally now than I did before. I had a pretty neutral accent before. I come from a place in the US that has sort of a standard American accent. It's like the TV American. There's very little about it that is regional regional, but there are certain terms, there are certain slang words, and there is sort of a certain rhythm of speaking that I only notice now that I go back and visit and I hear people who are from that specific area of the Midwest. This is both good and bad. I mean, I guess in some ways you could say it's a slight loss of identity, but I don't think it's that hard of an identity because I didn't, like I said, I didn't have a strong accent or anything. But it can be a bit strange and, you know, sometimes people will ask me, what is the, how do you express this or whatever, where you're from? And I can't think of it because I don't know if what I'm about to say naturally is really from where I'm from or if it's from the UK or from some other place or from friends I've met abroad who are not native speakers of English. I don't even know sometimes. That's also one of the reasons that I've stopped using so much regional slang because I started noticing it and I started realizing that people don't always understand it when you're not from that region, especially when you're around a lot of non-native speakers because slang is something that's so specific to a place. And unless you spend time in that place and unless you spend time around people who use that slang a lot, it makes no sense often. So some things I specifically dropped, like some expressions and phrases and things that didn't really make sense or that weren't super globally used, I stopped using them on purpose because I didn't want to be confusing. I didn't want people to not understand me. And then other things just sort of over time, I've just stopped using. Another thing that I have stopped doing quite so much since moving abroad is hesitating before trying new foods. Now, if you've known me for a while, or even if you know me still, you might be thinking, hold up, you're a picky eater. There are a lot of foods that you hesitate before eating. That is somewhat true. I am a slightly more picky eater than maybe the average person, although I'm not an extreme picky eater. I do eat plenty of things, but there are a good fair range of foods that I don't like. All of that being said, one, I am a much less picky eater now. I eat way more types of foods and I try way more types of things than I ever did before. And two, I am much more likely to try something even if I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna like it and even if I don't end up liking it, I'm much more likely just to try it now than I was before. Growing up in my house, there was one very simple rule. It was that you had to try everything that was on your plate. You didn't have to like it. You didn't even have to finish all of it. You had to try it. And if there was something that you very much didn't like, for example, I hated peas. I still did have to eat peas, but I would only have to eat peas when they were in mixed vegetables, which I could stand. There's just an example. So I did very much grow up with the mentality that trying new foods is a good thing. And I've always been fairly open-minded towards trying new foods that I haven't tried. That being said, because I especially was a bit picky when I was a kid and when I was a teenager, I would often try foods or types of foods, types of spices, um, certain ingredients. And if I didn't like it, I would write it off immediately and I just wouldn't eat any more of that type of food or I wouldn't eat any more of that ingredient. Let's use my all-time favorite vegetable, peas, as the example. I never ate them once I got to college and once I started cooking for myself. And then I discovered that I actually don't mind peas when they're in curry. If it's done well, if it's a certain type of curry and I'm eating it with non bread, I actually don't mind them so much. The same thing goes for a ton of other ingredients that I had had a couple of times, didn't like them, and now I actually do try. There have just been a lot more opportunities for me to try different types of foods and to be just a little bit more adventurous with it. The fifth and final thing that I'm gonna talk about in this video that I've stopped doing since moving abroad is holding on to keepsakes. 
I was always that type of person who would hold on to certain things. Like for example, I would hold on to ticket stubs from the movie theater. Maybe not every single movie that I saw, but I didn't go to the cinema that often. Cinema, see? Look, there's my British English coming out of nowhere. Theater is definitely what I would have called it growing up, and I didn't really go that often. But pretty much every time I went, I would hold on to that little ticket stub and I would keep it literally until it started fading. And I also held on to programs and playbills and things like that from orchestra concerts and theater performances and whatever else I would go and see. I loved holding on to that kind of thing. However, once again, we're gonna go back to the, the moving abroad, the literal moving abroad process. I couldn't take those things with me. It was just not feasible to bring a whole little suitcase full of, of ticket stubs and programs and playbills. So I left them at my parents' house when I moved to the UK, and then I moved back to the US for a little bit, and before I moved to France, I realized most of the stuff that I held on to really was not that valuable. There are a couple things, like maybe an orchestra concert here and there, or something that really does mean a lot to me, and when I look back at that, I feel the feelings, I feel the sentimentality, and those things I have kept and held on to over the years, some of which I still have left at my parents' house. Thank you, parents. Parents. I love you parents. But the majority of the things I went through and I just got rid of because I didn't need it. Now, of course, I still go to concerts, I still go to the movies, I still do stuff like that, and sometimes I will hold on to something if it's really sentimental, if I know it means a lot, or I'll hold on to it for a few weeks or a few months, but ultimately, I pretty much always get rid of it. I'm still a very sentimental person, but I think I've just transferred some of those sentimental feelings towards pictures and actual pure memories and things like that and those I hold on to and those I treasure but a little bit less stuff. So there you have it. There are five things that I have stopped doing or stopped doing quite so much since moving abroad. There are other things of course that I could add to this list but those are the things that I think sort of I don't know, are the most important, are the most impactful, are the things that I've stopped doing the most. If you're also someone who's living abroad or if you have lived abroad before, I would love to know if you can relate to any of these five things or if there are other types of habits that you've stopped doing. Let me know as always in the comments below. It seems like my voice has somewhat made it through this video. I'm drinking tea right now to try and help that. I hope all of you guys are staying healthy and well and warm if you are in winter right now, of course. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in seeing the other side of this video, the five things that I have started doing since moving abroad. Not gonna lie, I'm probably gonna do it anyway, but let me know if you're interested in seeing it and then maybe I will bump it up on my priority list. Thank you for watching and I will talk to you in another video very soon.